What's up, Al? How you doing, man? I'm having a wonderful time here in, you know, in prison, you know, but you know, this, uh, will you believe this? Don't you feel like you are like in a bad science fiction movie? No, I feel like I'm in prison. Yeah, well, you know. Uh, like I was. I, it's not a problem. For me. <laughs> it's not a problem for me. Well, Everybody's I, all a... complaining and everything. I'm like, oh, this is the best <laughs> quarantine incarceration I've ever had. Yeah, yeah well, uh, I've only been on the on jail on the other side. Yeah. Well, that's not true. Actually, I got put in jail in Arizona once for drunk driving when I was not drunk or driving. <laughs> you, want, you want to hear that story? Yes, I think I do. Okay. So I'm doing a comedy club in Phoenix, okay? I meet this girl, gorgeous girl. I mean, as a matter of fact, about two or three years later, I saw her and she looked stunning. I mean, she looked much better than when I first met her. Right. And she, had, she told me she had just come from the Bahamas where she was doing a shoot for, for Sports Illustri Illustrated. Right. For the bikini thing. Uh-huh. Okay, so that's how good looking this girl was. But when I met her, she was a little more, you know, she wasn't that glamour thing that they teach you how to do when you go to modern school and all that. Right. But anyway, she was she's a very good looking girl. So I meet her, she invites me over to her house, and she has a, she has a stick shift. And back then, I didn't know how to drive stick shift. So I, she asked me to drive. I said, sweetheart, you know, I'm going to ruin your car. I don't know how to drive stick shift. So she drives. But I didn't realize how drunk she was, you know. So now we're on a four lane highway and she is on the outside lane on the two, on the two sides that we're in. Mm -hmm. She decides to make a left turn, forgetting that there's another lane here and the car right next to her hits her and T-bones her. Now she can't open the driver's side door because it's jammed. We both come out of the driver's side door Five people, Mike, that didn't know me or had nothing against me, told the police that I was driving the car. So well, now, well, I don't know why. The policeman started asking questions and said, yeah, yeah, the guy was driving. So now I'm telling the guy, I'm not driving. She's telling the guy, I'm not driving. Right. You know, the guy says to me, he started giving me a breathalyzer test. You know, not a breathalyzer test. One of those uh, roadside tests. Right. So... And I never, I never, back, I never back talked to a cop, but I was so pissed. So I said to him, no. He says, excuse me? And I go, no, I'm not going to stand here and dance like a monkey for you. He go, take me to jail and give me a breathalyzer test. So he obliged me. <laughs> he put me, man, those cuffs were so tight. I swear my hands were blue by the time I got to the police station. Yeah. So now they take me to the police station. They throw me in a drunk tank with these two guys. I swear Mike... They will sit there like in a catatonic state. And on cue, they will both wake up on this catatonic state, run to the cell, and start banging on the cell and insulting and calling names to the police officers. <laughs> and I'm standing behind them going, <laughs> I'm going, I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> so... Two hours later, which doesn't make any sense because in two hours you can drop a lot of the alcohol content in your body. So they gave me a breath of likes to test. Now, you know that I don't drink. So I came out zero, zero, zero. Right. So she came, picked me up, you know. Uh, there was a happy ending to the story. Right. And, yeah. Congratulations. But I still got charged with the accident. So thank God that back then, this is quite a few years ago, there was no re reciprocity. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, now the states, you know, tell the other states what, what you did, you know. So I left Arizona and never came back. So uh, I was a fugitive in Arizona. I was, I was wanted for a, a, a traffic accident, you know, and I just left, you know. And I don't know what happened. I never saw the girl again until three years later that I saw her. Are you still a fugitive? No, well, this is over 10 years ago. So, I mean, I'm sure that this that's just, that's just limitation. Actually, I went back to Mr. Arizona. Romero. Mr. Romero. <laughs> Al, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do this to you, buddy, but they paid me a lot of money to have you come on and tell your story. And tell the story. Huh? I have a no, good no. friend who's a lawyer. It's okay. I have a friend. I didn't mean to do this to you, but. But stupid me, I go to Arizona like a few years later and I start telling the story on the radio station about it. <laughs> and then I'm saying, what am I doing? What am I doing? I'm confessing to a crime. 
know? right but you know thank god nothing happened and it was a beautiful girl so it was it was worth the trouble is that why they all said you did it you think i have no idea mike he was you know you know uh they say that the most unreliable uh is is eyewitnesses they're the most unreliable there's a lot of people in jail that have been put in jail by by eyewitnesses that later on have been let out by dna testing that they proved they they weren't the the culprit right. because uh eyewitness you know people see whatever they want to see yeah yeah that was so weird man that was so weird so what what how are you i mean you've been you know you've been on how long you've been on the cruise ship well jesus man i start i if i wasn't the first i one of the very first comedy club comedians to start doing uh cruise ships on the nina uh, pinta and santa maria <laughs> i was <laughs> i was I was a comedian. On Which the, on one did you like the best, Al? Uh, well, I did the Pinta first. That was my favorite one. <laughs> <laughs> I started doing cruise ships in 1980. Wow. That's how long I've been doing. Because Don Casino had just started their agency down here in South Florida. Right, right. And uh, Candy uh, saw me perform, and they wanted to hire, they wanted to get younger people on the cruise ships. And they hired me and they kept offering me work and I kept turning it down because I, I used to get sick, sick real bad until they offered me enough money. I said, well, for that kind of money, I'll throw up, mm -hmm. you know, and, but yeah, on and off, I've been doing it uh, since 1980. But back then comedy clubs used to book like almost a year in advance. So I will, I will fill my entire calendar with uh, comedy club show uh, bookings. And then whatever I had open in my calendar, I filled it up with, uh, with cruise ships. You know, I wanted to, I was thinking earlier, I wanted to ask you this. Why did you get into comedy? How and why? Well, I, you know, I, I always liked comedy, man. But I, to tell you the truth, I got into stand-up comedy more to be an actor than to be a, to be a stand-up comedian. Right. It's just that I, I, I became a comedian at the same time that the comedy exploded in the United States in the 80s, you know. Mm -hmm. And there was so much work, you know, that, you know, I got, in a way... Now, looking back, I, I should have stayed in L.A. more and go out for more parts because you can't make a living in L.A. I used to go out for three months at a time, work in the road, mm -hmm. and then come, then come home, you know, hoping to get a TV show, to get on a TV show. But, uh, yeah, I started because I, I, I thought that stand-up comedy, although I love doing stand-up comedy and I always was a fan, I wanted to do it, it was a vehicle for me to get into acting, you know. But that's, you also, that's why. Weren't you a, a cop for a while? I have a degree in criminology from Florida State University. Yeah, uh, for the city of Miami. Yeah, for mm -hmm. very short, for very short period of time. Right. You know, I didn't like. I wanted to work for the FBI. Yeah. Uh, and that's a long story that you know I, we cannot have time to do. Why I did not join the FBI. Right. You know, but uh, you know, every everybody in my family followed me. At one point, I had a sergeant, a lieutenant, and two FBI agents in my family, and they all followed me. Of course they the did because of what happened in Arizona. They had to. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, but, but yeah, I started the whole thing and then I left. But you, but so you knew you wanted to be a comedian. That's what you wanted to be. I wanted to be an actor. Oh. And comedy, comedy was a secondary thing. And I saw comedy as a great vehicle to showcase myself and potentially get it, you know, like, like a sitcom or something like that. So in the 80s, who would be, when you started out, or whatever uh -huh. who would who was your mentor who who did you look up to who was your favorite who were your favorite comedians well my favorite comedians i, I really didn't have a mentor because what happened to me happened so fast man mm -hmm. that uh i'll tell you later on um well, my favorite comedians were prior mm -hmm. you know a uh, carlin me too yeah rickles yeah and uh and although he's not technically a comedian uh carson and I'll yeah. tell you what, I, I like prior for the rawness and the, you know, how truthful he was and how raw he was in his comedy. Right. Carlin for how inventive his comedy is, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, Rickles because of the dealing with the audience, which I love to do. Mm -hmm. And Carson because of the facial expressions. Carson will make people laugh just by, you know, mm -hmm. you know, making a facial expression. So I like those who were my four most four uh, favorite guys. But I really didn't have a mentor. The closest thing that I had a mentor was a guy named Lenny, Sh uh, Lenny, um, Lenny Shore. 
You know who Lenny Shore is? No, no, no. I don't know if you're old enough. Do you remember the the Dean Martin Comedy Hour? I I I'm I don't remember it. Okay, well I there know was a, of it. I don't know if okay. I I, re, I know what it was. Yeah, there was a sketch there where this guy was a barber and mm -hmm. and Dean Martin would sit down to get his hair cut supposedly, and this guy would tell him jokes, mm -hmm. and that's was Lonnie Shore. Well, Lonnie Shore used to come to the club where I used to start it with and um, became friends. And uh, he was the one that got me on the Murph Griffin show, to tell you the truth. I, I did a Murph Griffin show doing comedy for just a year. You know? Wow. I you scared? I didn't know enough to be scared. You know, you know when yeah. you're stupid and you don't know what you're doing? You know, like a little... <laughs> no, you know, I'm not, I don't really? know anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a little kid goes from one branch of the tree to another because yeah. he doesn't know what it is to fall down and break his yeah. leg. Yeah. You know, and he's fearless. So it was I. I, I, yeah. I, I didn't know. I, you know, yeah. I, I have been doing comedy for less than a year. And Lonnie has said to me, you know, Al, when you're ready, you know, I'm very, I'm good friends with Merv Griffin. I can get you an audition. And now he's thinking two, three years down the road. Mm -hmm. So about 10 months into it, you know, uh, I was going, you know, I went on vacation. I had my vacation time. I decided to go with another comic to L.A., and I said to Lonnie, hey, listen, I'm ready, <laughs> I'm ready to do the show. Can you get me in? And he says, are you sure? Are yeah. you sure you want to be seen? Yeah. And I said, yeah. So you sure you're ready to go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I'm ready. What the hell do I know? Right. So now I go to LA and the owners of the comic strip got me uh, to, uh, to Mitzi Shore. And Mitzi gave me a spot. Uh, because they told her that I had an audition for the Merv Griffin show. So she put me in the audition and put a bunch of other people on that audition. She used me to put other, some of her other guys. So now I'm at the comedy store. You, nobody knows me. I don't know, don't know me from Adam. I'm sitting there and the, the MC, uh, Argus Hamilton, who has been there from the beginning of time as the, you know, the, the main MC at comedy store, Come up to me like three minutes before I'm supposed to go on stage. He says, listen, uh, we have a little problem. I go, what? He says, uh, well, uh, Steve Martin showed up and he wants to do a set. And I go, what, what? He says, so we're going to bump you up. I go, no, no, please. no, 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 please, come on. You, let me go, let me go. I'm only going to do five minutes. Let me go and put him after, you know. I mean, I can't follow, you know, Steve Martin. He said, no, I'm sorry, he's going up. So now Steve Martin goes up and he does that he gets a standing ovation when he shows up on stage. He gets a standing ovation when he does Happy Feet. And he gets a standing ovation when he gets off the stage. And now, the comedy of our romance. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, this guy, Argos Hamilton, who I became pretty good friends with later on, did something very classy, which he didn't owe me nothing because he didn't know me from Adam. Right. He went on stage right after Steve Martin got off stage and he said to the audience, do you like Steve Martin? Yeah. Well, listen, Steve Martin was, was not always Steve Martin. He started in clubs like this, okay? And you're going to see people that are going to come after Steve Martin. That that might be the next Steve Martin. So mm. I want you to give all the attention and the love to the next guy that you did to Steve Martin. And then he introduced me. And I had one of the best sets I ever had in my life. I could not believe that I followed Steve Martin after three standing ovation. I killed. I killed. And... Mitzi came off from her perch, which is almost unheard of. And she says, what do you live? What do you live? And I go, I live in LA. Well, you're moving here, right? You're moving here. And I go, well, no, I don't have any plans. Oh, yes, you are. You have to move here. You've got the Merv Griffin show. Uh. I found out from her, not from the producer of the Merv Griffin show, that I got it. He says, you have to come here. You know, I'll make you a regular. <clears throat> and I go, okay. That day, I got the Murph Griffin show. I became a regular at the comedy store, and I have managers and agents all wow. in one night. Wow. And I moved to L.A., you know? I mean, but, I mean, I had 20 minutes of material, and 15 of them were about South Florida. <laughs> <laughs> so, now I'm in L.A. with five minutes of material. <laughs> and listen to this. 15 of them were about yeah. South Florida. <laughs> listen, listen to the kicker. <laughs> the manager, the manager that I got on the agents, guess what my first gig was after that? I got Whoa. to open for Ray Charles. 
Oh my God. So, and I have 20 minutes of bullshit material, you know? But I tell you, man, where you're under the gun, you very, you quickly come up with stuff, you know? So I pulled it off. I went, I did the Blue Max, which at the time was the, the biggest, not the biggest, but I mean the most prestigious uh, club in right. Chicago. And I pulled it off, man. Right. I pulled it off. Uh, well, you had, how old were you then? I started late. I was 30 years old. Oh, but you, yeah. you made some great connections in the beginning. You're off to a good start. And yeah, man. I mean, I, listen, I went from zero to 60, you know, right. like this, right. But then I had a plateau because when in the eighties, there were no parts for Hispanics, man. There really wasn't, you know, as a matter of fact, the New York times had an article uh, that said the invisible people of, uh, of, of Hollywood. And it was Hispanics at that time in the eighties, as a Hispanic actor, you could either be a drug dealer, a waiter. If you were a female, you were a prostitute, or you were a maid. And those were the only parts that show up. I would get compliments. They would, they would give me this compliment. We'll sit down and go, see, Al, the problem is that you have an air of success about you. You're, 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 you're an educated guy. And I go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you trying to tell me that Hispanic people cannot be successful and educated? Well, no, 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 please don't take it that way. But uh, how exactly would you like me to take it? Right. You know? Yeah, they will tell me that, you know, they will tell me this. Basically, what they're trying to tell me, there's no parts for you. That's right. what they were trying to was, tell me. Now, you still have a pretty thick accent from, I would say. Exactly. Was, well, it, you know, very, was it more thick then? Yeah, more or less the same, you yeah. know. Yeah. You know, I mean, I I mispronounce the same things because Spanish people have the uh, problem with pronouncing a. There's like four different sounds of the letter a, mm -hmm. and there's about two or two or three different sounds of the letter e and i, and those are the words that they even even if you learn how to speak English, you know, if you don't learn it real early in life, you know, those two things become a problem and right. accentuate your accent. But, you know, so now uh, I have a, a manager. Uh, at one time, you know, uh, after I did that, I stayed with his manager for a little while, and then I drop him off, and then I did the Tonight. Do you remember the Tomorrow Show with Tom Snyder? Yes. I was the last comedian to appear on that show. Wow. I did the show. I killed again, one of those magical nights. So the executive producer of the show comes running down from his booth. You know who it was? Roger Ailes, the guy they end up becoming the head of Fox News. Yeah, yeah. Right. So Roger Ailes comes, you know, fat guy. He comes down around. <laughs> you have a manager? And I go, no, I want to manage you. I go, okay. And excuse me, but who are you? <laughs> I didn't know who he was. Right. Then I told I told Mitzi, I called Mitzi that night. And I said, oh, you know, uh, you were great. And, and I said, Mitzi, there's a guy named Roger Ailes that said he wants to be a manager. Are you kidding me? Are you? My God, do you know who he is? And I go, I have no clue who this guy is. So she tells me what a big guy he is. So, so he became my manager. Uh, and... Uh, one of the things he did was, <laughs> it was funny. They signed me to William Morris. So I'm sitting down with me, Roger Ailes, my manager, and the head of uh, Salomon, which was the top guy at, at William Morris. And they're talking to each other like I'm not there. <laughs> well, see, see, Al is this and Al is that. I'm going, what, are, what the hell? Are, I'm, it's like I'm, 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 like I'm a lamp, you right. know? Right, you know. So they're coming up with this, all these ideas about doing stuff. And one of the great ideas they come up with, because there were no parts for Hispanics, you know, and since I have an air of success about me, <laughs> <laughs> they tell me, get rid of your accent. You get rid of your accent, we can find a million parts. You know, you look Italian, you look that, you, we can find a million parts for you to play, you know, if you get rid of your accent. I said, oh, well, I... You know, I, I wasn't too happy about it because you mean tell me I can't have an accent? You know, now you can now you can have anything. You know, now they don't care. But back then, you know, you cannot have an accent. That was a little bit of a, you know, it's like telling a black guy, well, you, 
if your skin was only lighter, you know, <laughs> you know, would, I mean, this be, would this be the time of like when Freddie Prince was, uh, no, no, this is after Freddie. Freddie died in the late eight, 70s. This is yeah. the early 80s. Oh, okay. This is the early 80s. So now they t- they send me to the best speech coach in Hollywood. I took three lessons with a guy. The guy back then, this how how long ago? It's a tape recorder. The guy goes like this, click, turns off the click, the tape recorder. He says, "I can't help you." <laughs> and I go, "What do you mean you can't help me?" He says, "I can't." I go, why? He says, because your problem is you don't hear the difference. If you can't hear the difference, I can't tell you how to change it. Yeah. I, he, will, he will have me say something on the tape, and then he will say it, and he will have me hear it, and he says, do you see the difference? I go, no. <laughs> <laughs> It sounds exactly to me. So he says, I can't help you. If you cannot hear what the difference, I can't teach you anything. I can't teach you how to get rid of your accent if you don't even act, are aware that you have one, you know? Now you, you also, you auditioned for uh, Scarface, yeah? You want to hear, you want me to tell I love story? that story, bro. <laughs> okay, it's a long story now. Okay, same manager. But I will say this before, let me interrupt you. Yeah. Of all the things that you've done in your life, and I've known you a long time now, of all the things you've done and all the things you've accomplished and all the good work that you've done and the places you've been, the one thing that I'm most amazed by was your ability to actually get on Zoom tonight. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm a monkey with a typewriter when it comes to technical I have to stuff. say, I swear, I feel like you're punishing me <laughs> for asking you to be on the show. I tell you what to do, I get a call back, I don't see anything. <laughs> I do. I don't have email. Writer. Like you like. It's almost like I don't know what it is. It's so amazing. It's like he's gonna am, call man. me back. You you psych yourself out. It's almost like the speech therapist guy. It's like <laughs> you you tell yourself you can't do it, and then no, I don't see it. I don't understand it. Yeah, My yeah, brain yeah. doesn't work that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. I mean, by repetition, I learned how to do it. Yeah. You know, I mean, you have taught me a lot of stuff that I do now. I remember I used to call you every day. Yeah. How do I do my, how do I do that? How do I do this? How do I do that? I, and I've learned, I mean, you know, I'm right. very, <coughs> very basic stuff, but I learned right. a lot that you have taught me uh, because I, I knew nothing. I'm like, I'm literally a monkey with a typewriter. Right. I, I have no idea what I'm doing. But you wrote a but, book. Yeah, but I have nothing to do with know how to do technical stuff. I mean, that's just hitting kit, key, keys on a on a on a keyboard, you know. Right. Um, so yeah, I different. want to tell me the Scarface story. Okay, so I have the same manager. They come to me, uh, but now my ma- actually my agent, uh, William Morris, was Josh Carlin's second wife. You know, uh, which you know, I mean, I was over the moon over that. I mean, Carly have always been one of my favorite comedians mm-hmm. you know to have his wife as you know uh, ex-wife as his as let me interrupt you because i feel the same way about george carlin why is george carlin why what is it about him for you personally well first of all he's very inventive he can make comedy out of anything and the, one of the most prolific comedians i mean he has hours and hours of material right you know how hard it is to write comedy yeah you know how hard it is to come up with something funny i mean you can come up with a lot of stuff it doesn't mean it's going to be funny Right. You know, I mean, Carlin was a genius, man. I mean, he, I mean, he had hours and hours of, and so inventive. You go, God damn, I wish I would have thought of that, you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, I mean, you know, yeah. he's very, very inventive guy. Very, yeah. very, a very prolific. Uh, but anyway, so, so now uh, she calls me and she says, listen, they're doing a movie about, you know, they, they're doing a remake of Scarface, the old, you know, uh, what you might call it, uh, Al Capone thing with a Cuban twist. And I think, you know, it is. That's, that's the, the Scarface was the original. Scarface was uh, Al Capone. That was the original movie. Scarface was about Al Capone. But I do it with a Cuban twist. So she sent me the script and I read the script and go, wow, this is, this is really amazing. You know, this is a great script. So now they have me auditioning for the part of Manolo, the guy that was a sidekick to... Uh, what you gonna call it? Uh, Tony Montana. Uh, Tony Montana. Al yeah, Pacino. but I mean, Al Pacino. Al Pacino. Okay, so 
wow, oh, man, I'm reading the part. I go, this is fantastic. I mean, I, you know, I go to an acting teacher, I practice it. I, I have it down. I mean, I have this part down, man. I, I mean, I, I really, really get it, know what I'm doing, you know? Uh, so now I go, I'm, I'm waiting to audition. I'm at Universal Studios. I went to audition and I see this gorgeous woman, man, like about 10, 15 feet away from me. The next thing I know, I don't even know how I got there. The next thing I know, I'm standing right next to her. And I'm trying to talk to her. By the way, for all those that know that I'm married, I was not with my wife at the time, okay? So anyway, so, <laughs> so, so now I'm talking to her, you know, I'm making her laugh, you know, and, and you know, I asked her, she said, uh, I, she found out I was Cuban. Oh, I love Cuban food. I said, I just finished doing a movie in Key West and I fell in love with Cuban food. I said, what movie was that? I said, they did a, the re, not a remake, but the sequel to Greece. She played the part of uh, Olivia Newton-John, mm -hmm. you know? So uh, anyway, so I said to her, well, you know, I mean, hey, listen, when we get, when we get the movie and we're both going to get the movie, uh, you know, I'll take you to the best Cuban restaurants in Miami. Oh, really? Oh, fantastic. So now I basically have a date with this woman, right? So, and she goes, she goes to read first. She comes out and she says, I'm going to hold you up to that Miami thing. And I go, the Cuban food. I go, you got it. <laughs> I'm over the moon. I'm going, I'm auditioning for a major TV show. I have this gorgeous woman that I basically have a date with her. You know, I didn't know. She wasn't famous at the time. So now I go to read, okay? Now I go to his office. The office is a huge office, and she's sitting all the way at the end. I open the door, and she stands up. That's Alexis Gordon, who's a casting director, the main casting director at Universal. She stands up, and she goes, Al Romero, I've heard nothing but fantastic stuff about your agent. Come right in, come right in. So I'm walking into the thing. And she says, sit down. And before my ass hits the sofa, she says to me, unfortunately, the part already being cast. Oh, did she say sitting, about your agent or from your agent? No, I heard, I heard wonderful thing from your agent. From your agent, from okay. Your, yeah, okay. Right. Yeah. That's before my sofa hit, my ass hits the sofa. Mm -hmm. Mike, this is the way men think. When she tells me, she tells me I'm not gonna get the part. The first thing that comes to my mind is, I'm not gonna fuck the blonde. <laughs> not that I'm not getting the movie. <laughs> the first thing that comes to my mind, <laughs> damn it, I'm not gonna fuck the blonde. <laughs> so now, now I start, I, I've never done this. It's totally unprofessional, you don't do that. I start oh. arguing with her. No, 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 you don't understand. You don't understand, I'm this guy. I'm this guy. I'm perfect. I grew up in the streets. Of Was this the Havana. Stephen Bauer character? Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm going, no, no, no. He says, no. And she's trying to placate me and talk to me and stuff like that. And I go, you don't understand. This is me. The guy, they haven't seen me. They have to see. I can guarantee you that if they see me, they will, I will get the part. I've never done this in my life before. You know, so she says to me, she shot me up, man. She says, Al, the, the, the director, Brian De Palma, sees the character as this little guy, Al Pacino, being followed by this big guy. You know, he likes that contrast that the little guy is the right. boss and the big guy is the follower. And I keep arguing with her. And she says to me, Al, very, very calm. Al. She's talking to me like I'm a mental patient, you know. Al, listen, you can be the greatest actor in the world. You can act 6'2". <laughs> <laughs> what do you say to that? I have no answer. I have uh, no comeback uh, to that. I right. can't. I can't be six two. So I, I, I'm, I'm putting my hand. I'm, I'm like this, and I said, "But listen, there's a bunch of other parts in this movie. You know, mm -hmm. I can, I can play another part." She says, "I, yeah, Al, but listen again. The air of success comes back to haunt me." She says, "Yeah, but you." You know, you don't look. You're not a street character. You know, they they want street characters to for have an part. air of success about you. <laughs> well, she didn't say that, but basically, what she's saying, she, you know. Uh, so basically, what they're telling me, I'm too white to be Hispanic. That's what yeah. they're telling me, basically, yeah. you know, in 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 code. So, so she said they want more like like street people, you know. And I go, but I'm an actor. 
They can put makeup on me and I can act anything you want to. I'm, a, I'm an actor. I, right. I, I can act. She shot me up again. She says, Al? <laughs> With that mental patient talk, you know. Al, we don't want actors that can act street. We want street people yeah. that can act. Yeah. <laughs> she shot me up again. So now what do I say to that? So now I am totally, dis- I, I, I'm not saying anything. I'm, I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving. I'm still sitting there, you know. She basically have given me cues to get the fuck out of my office. You know? <laughs> and I'm not leaving. I'm sitting there. I'm not leaving. And I'm going, I can't believe this. I mean, I'm just, can't. she says, he says, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're a stand-up comedian, right? I go, yeah. He says, there's a part. It's not a big part, but it's a good part uh, where, you know, of a stand-up comedian on the show. And the stand-up comedian can do three minutes of his act. So you'll be able to showcase yourself in the movie as a, as a comedian. I go, okay, that's the part that Belser end up getting. Right? Yes. Right. At well, the nightclub when they shoot Right, up. right. But what the, the thing is that the movie ran so long, they start cutting, cutting things out. So right. Belser, you never see the three minutes of material. All you see is Belser on stage introducing something. Right. Okay. But the, originally, the part was for you to do three minutes of, of, of material and then mm-hmm. introduce whatever happens. Okay. So now she tells me, she says, I, she, she, comes, oh, she, she comes over from her perch and comes and sits right next to me. <laughs> and she's talking to me like a mental patient. Look, and this is what I'm going to do for you, okay? What I'm going to do is, instead of going you, taking you through all the auditions, I am going to take you to the last audition. You don't have to audition for anything. You will go and audition for Brian De Palma and uh, you know, Oliver Stone, the, the, the writer. You know, I'll take you that. You don't have to book anything. Oh, well, okay. Thank you very much. You know, I leave, you know, I'm going, God, I'm not going to fuck the blonde. This is going to happen. <laughs> so, so now, yeah, because now I don't have a big part. I'm just a, I'm just a two big thing. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm basically an extra, <laughs> you know, the start of the movie, the female start of the movie is not going to bang some, you know, extra guy, you know? So that's out of the question. I'm not banging the blonde, you know? <laughs> so I'm totally bummed out. So now, now, what I go about two or three days later, I go to the audition for the part of the comedian. So now they bring me in and they tell me to do my act. Uh, here's Brian De Palma, uh, Marty Bregman, who was the executive producer, Alexis Gordon, and Oliver Stone. So I'm starting to do my act, and Oliver Stone is sitting there writing shit. So I think they're taking notes about me and, you know, whatever, or give me some pointers or something like that. So, well, thank you very much. It's very funny. And I leave. I don't get the part. I don't get anything. So now, Angel Salazar is in the movie. He plays Chichi, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I almost killed. I almost killed Angel. Um, So I find out, because I was dating this girl uh, who was an actress who had friends that had come see me at the comedy store and seen my act. And one of the guys tells my girlfriend, or the girl I was dating, she really wasn't my girlfriend. Listen, they're stealing your, fr- your boyfriend's act. They're doing it. They're giving the lines to Pacino to say, you know? And they're, and, and, and they're asking another, another guy, the guy that's, you know, the little guy, they're asking him because what happened was that Oliver Stone had lost the, all the things that he wrote about my act. He lost a little piece of paper and he's asking, He's asking Angel to tell him the lines that, he, that I do that he wants to give to Pacino. Now, what happens is that the movie ran so long, they caught anything that was not pertaining mm. to developing the story. Mm-hmm. They took it out. So now I find out about it. I confronted, you know, um, you know Angel. I wanted to kill him. So, oh, yeah, oh, man, help, help, You know, I, I, I'm going to call Oliver. I'm going to call Oliver. So we go over to his house. And he's talking, and I'm on the other line, you know, I'm hearing the conversation. And he's telling Oliver Stone, uh, you know, hey, Al Romero says he's going to sue me. He's going to sue you. He's going to sue everybody because you stole it. And Oliver Stone says, you tell Al Romero to go fuck himself because... <laughs> 
I'm on the other line, listen to me. You tell Al Romero to go fuck himself because you can't copyright stand up, and which is true. You cannot copy. copy. <laughs> and I can steal his whole act if I want to, and he can do a fucking thing about it. So now I'm on the other line, and before I get a chance to say, you fucking scumbag motherfucker, which is what I want to say, he goes click and hangs off the phone. So I don't get the satisfaction of telling this guy what I think of him. So now, I go to the comedy store and I tell Mitzi about it. <laughs> and Mitzi goes, oh, 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 well, I can't believe that. Don't worry, I have the best, I have the best entertainment lawyer in this town and we're gonna sue them. And, he, and I said, yeah, Mitzi, but I can't sue them because there's no copyright. No, 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 don't worry about it. No, no, we're gonna sue them, we're gonna shame them. And what's gonna happen is the, 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 the you know, the, the, the papers, the Hollywood, Report is all I will pick right. up the story because he'll be the little guy that they stole from. This big U Universal Studios and stuff like that are picking on the little guys and told his stole his act. You know, we sue them, and even if you don't make anything out of that, the publicity you'll get so much publicity that you know everybody will know who you are. Mm -hmm. I go well. I mean, that's a consolation. Well, they took everything out of the movie, so they fucked me again because now I can't sue them because I have nothing to sue them for. Mm -hmm. So let's recap. <laughs> I don't get to fuck the blonde I don't get the major part I don't get the shitty part I don't get to sue them So I got fucked every which way Oh, but you got Oliver Stone to tell you to go fuck yourself <laughs> Yeah, exactly, I forgot that part <laughs> I got a famous guy to tell me You tell Oliver to go fuck himself Some people You didn't just not, you know Like you get to see, I talk to <laughs> You're on the other line listening, and you don't even get to say anything back. No, I was going to you fuck you. We're going to tell him you scumbag piece of shit, and you click. And you get a chance to tell him. What did you say to Al Angel after that phone conversation? I know. I told him I'm going to sue. I'm going to sue them. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I, and I said I'm going to sue you, you bastard. I mean, I, I we, yeah. you know, he still brings that up. He tries yeah. to make a joke out of it. I know. Know. You know, from time to time. Uh, about that situation. No, I wanted to kill him. I wanted to kill him. So, oh, uh, I'm sorry, man. I mean, they put so much pressure on me. Uh, I didn't well, know what to do. Well, you know what to do. I know what you do. You tell him you forgot. That's what you do. You tell him, oh, Oliver, I'm sorry. I don't know the guy's act. I don't remember. That's what you do, you scumbag piece of shit. What do you somehow, mean you know what to do? Somehow I'm picturing you on the phone with, uh, with what was the actress's name? The actress's name? Yeah, the blonde. Oh, uh, oh, oh, God! Uh, now I'm getting a, a, a mental yeah. fart here. Uh, Michelle Pfeiffer. Michelle, Michelle Pfeiffer. Pfeiffer. Hello, Michelle. Yes. Um, <laughs> 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 Let me tell you what's happened here, and then you tell her the whole story, and she says, um, "Oliver Stone told me to tell you to go fuck yourself." <laughs> Hangs up. <laughs> But, dude, wow, you're so close. That movie, too, like, oh. oh can you imagine? Did you I watch mean, the movie when it came out? Oh, yeah, of course I did. I, 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 of course I did watch Did you movie. cry? No, I didn't cry, but I said, yeah, man, this could have changed my life. That, yeah. that thing could have been uh, life-changing, you know? I have a similar story um, related to the movie Shawshank Redemption. <laughs> <laughs> Except I got the part. <laughs> is that the same is that the same jail yes they filmed where i was they filmed it in uh mansfield ohio yeah right when i was incarcerated when i was 19 years old and i was on a date after i got out and i was you know doing my life i was on a date a blind date in coconut grove and i was saw the movie shawshank redemption and i'm sitting there and i'm eating the popcorn and i remember her saying after the movie she's like you know you were very selfish. I'm like, why? She goes, you ate all the popcorn and didn't give me any. <laughs> but because the more I watched the movie, every time I would see a scene, I'm like, wait, I think <laughs> I know that place. <laughs> but I couldn't say it to her. We're on a date. Oh, right. So you don't after, want to scare her. <laughs> yeah. So after the end, she's like, let's go. I go, no, I have to see the credits. So I'm watching the credits. It says, thank you to the people of Mansfield, Ohio. Um, and that's where they filmed it. It was supposed to take place in Maine, but I was wow. actually, I was actually in there, man. It was actually in it. Wow. So, so you then 
but you just kept doing that. The only dif- the only difference is I didn't get to bang the blonde. You got banged by a couple of blondes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, Bully would have done better if I told her the story. <laughs> Probably so, yeah. They have a thing for guys like that. Um, uh-huh. So, yeah. Did you, I heard that Michelle Pfeiffer, they, they didn't really even want her, and she had to fly herself out there. They didn't even pay for her plane ticket. Like, she, I, was, she was nobody then. She was no. Well, she had just done Greece, but the Greece had not even come out yet. It was yeah. still... It was no... You know, it wasn't even out yet, you know? I also heard and didn't realize that the only scenes that were really filmed in Miami was that one with the chainsaw in South Beach when they were driving down the street. Uh, you know you know why, right? Oh, everything else was in LA. No, why? Well, because the Cubans in Miami went crazy. Oh, did they? And I had something to do with that. What happened? <laughs> well, it's been long enough. I think I can say it now. Uh, the woman in Miami Herald that wrote the story about how bad the Cubans were being portrayed. Right. I gave her the script. Oh, really? So she based her article on the script because I had the script and I gave it to her. And they wrote and she, she, she actually put out, you know, you know the, the, the story and the, the lines and stuff like that. And she wrote a scathing article about how, you know, how bad they were portraying Cubans, you know, that would make it sound like all Cubans were criminals and stuff like that. And uh, the Cubans in Miami went crazy, man. They, you know, they were they were gonna boycott the movie and so that. So they did as little as possible. The, the whole movie was gonna supposed to be filmed in Miami, mm-hmm. and they decided to pull more than three quarters of the filming in Miami because of that. Right. Yeah. You know, I saw Stephen Bauer in. Uh... So I guess I, I, I guess I guess I did fuck him a little bit. Yeah. Hold on, yeah. Oliver Stone's on the phone. Hold on. A <laughs> you want to talk to Al? Oh, hold on a second. <laughs> Oh, tell him to go fuck himself. Okay. <laughs> Oliver Stone says, go fuck yourself. Anyway, but I saw Stephen Bauer in South Beach. I remember you, we taught comedy traffic school together or whatever. I had a, a class at a hotel in South Beach and I went upstairs and he was at the bar with a girl having a drink. And I was at the other end getting a cup of coffee for class. And I saw Stephen Bauer and I went over to him. I said, whose sister are you fucking now? Haven't you heard that he <laughs> And he laughed. I just you know, saw him in Better Call Saul. He was. Uh, oh yeah, he, yeah, right. He, and he was later on in uh, Breaking Bad. I didn't remember that scene, but he was there. But he was the in scene, Ray Donovan too. He was good in. I think. Oh yeah, he was. He did a good, uh, uh, good. Uh, what you might call it, Israeli accent. He know? was very good. Yeah, but uh, good. you know, I had a. Uh, I've never had good, you know, luck with famous people, man. You know, it always disappoint me. I saw uh, Lou Ferrigno at uh, an American Airlines uh, Admirals Club. He was sitting there, and I went up to him and go, "Did you used to be green?" <laughs> and he, he gave me the dirtiest look, man. <laughs> and he stood up and walked away from me. And I go, God, this guy doesn't have any sense of humor whatsoever, you know. I saw Chad Ochocinco in the Miami airport around Thanksgiving. I guess he, because he's from Miami. And right. He was going home. He had some friends with him. And I saw him in the airport in Miami. I was coming home from the ship. And I tried to talk to him. And he really, he blew me off pretty bad. I even had my Bengals jersey and everything. And I wanted to pick something up and throw it at him and go, catch that, you motherfucker. I know, man. I mean, I've never had very good, uh, you know, with famous people. I've always, always been disappointed, you know? Yeah. But uh, you know, we, you know, we have a lot of good receivers from this area who turn out to be all wacko, you know. Good what? <clears throat> good receivers, uh, great receivers that come out of the South. Oh Florida. yeah, yeah. You know? you know, I just watched this interesting thing called the uh, Color, the uh, America in Color. It's it was on the Smithsonian Channel, but it's on Prime right now until the thirtieth. I, I, I think you told me. Yeah. Man, it starts off in the twenties. All that black and white footage has been colorized, but just the history. Like I didn't even know about the hurricane in Miami. Uh, Nineteen what? What year? I, I don't know the exact year, but it, they didn't have like the, in the tw- you mean in the twenties? Yes. Yeah, it was nineteen twenty six. It hit Cuba too. And, it was and they didn't even know it was coming. Like it was. I, well, it, back then they didn't have the yeah, technology. That that same hurricane hit Havana and destroyed Havana. It was a, that was. I don't know. They 
in Havana, they didn't know him by the name. They used to call it the Hurricane of 26. Mm -hmm. My father was like uh, seven years old or something like that. And he remembered, it, you know, remember so he used to talk about it. That's another thing I wanted to ask you. you so you're going to be a comedian. You're trying to, you're doing all this stuff. And what did your parents think about this at the time? <laughs> well, first of all, I didn't tell anybody. I made sure that nobody that knew me right. uh, saw that I was doing that. Uh, How come? How come? Well, because I didn't. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. No, you're fine. Don't worry the about it. The you're monkey fine. with a typewriter screw. I knew up. it was going to happen sooner or later. Okay. It's okay. So, anyway, so what happens is that I didn't want nobody to show up. I didn't want to, you know, I mean, I, I bombed three weeks in a row. I mean, like, really bad. I mean, I was not one of those guys that was funny from the beginning. I was horrible from the beginning, you know, and I had no. <laughs> I had I didn't know how to deal with the audience, which now is one of the, my the things that I do best. Uh, I didn't know how to deal with the audience. This was my idea of handling a heckler. Shut the fuck up! <laughs> <laughs> the audience goes like this. That's it. <laughs> Show is over. Nobody laughs after that, you know. But that's how I used to, you know, I used to deal with that. I didn't, I didn't get any laugh for three weeks. And then so one day something clicked and it was like, I took off like a rocket for, for the first three weeks. Nothing. I will go there. I will be total silence. It was Why did you keep doing it? What did you, what made you think? Go ahead. Well, I know I, I said to myself, I couldn't wait to go back. I said, this is it. This is what I should be doing. If I'm doing this bad and I can't wait to go back, yeah. this is what I should be doing in my life. I'm just going to get better. It's just a matter of time. I've just had to keep <laughs> at it. I already been acting for a while though. I've been on stage for a while though. I, I joined, uh, I joined um, uh, com uh, uh, an acting. You know, she was. It was a great. Uh, well, she was not really that great. She, but she was a very well known uh, acting teacher down here. As a matter of fact, back in the day when they used to do Flipper, mm -hmm. uh, what you know, the the yeah. guy from uh, you know. I forget his name. Do you know who the actor is? No. Uh, the guy that played uh, Obi in um, Andy Griffin. He became oh, a great Ron director. Howard. Ron, uh, Howard. Ron Howard. Yeah. So Ron Howard and his brother were, were doing Flipper. And uh, she was their, their acting coach. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, Ruth Foreman. And she used to call herself the first lady of the Florida theater. <laughs> <laughs> she was very, very affected woman. You know, uh, you know how I auditioned for her? Yeah. Okay, so I go to her class, never acting in my life before, never been on stage in my life before. She says, I was working, you know, so I took, I, I, I went to her class on, a, I think it was a Thursday. I'm on a Thursday. She says, okay, next week, I said, I don't take everybody. You have to audition for me, <laughs> for me to decide whether I want to teach you or not. She used to talk like that, very, very affected. You know? mm -hmm. She says, so next week, I want all of you to prepare a monologue or something and come back and do it for me, and I'll decide whether you're worthy, actually, we're worthy of me taking the time mm -hmm. to teach you. She says, and try to be creative. So I go home, I forget all about it. Wednesday night, I go, holy shit, I'm supposed to go to class tomorrow. I have nothing prepared. No idea what I'm going to do. Right. Didn't read anything. Th comes Thursday night. On my way, I have no idea what I'm going to do. On my, I figure this is it. You know, the woman's going to tell me to go screw myself. On my way out, I pick up a can of Lysol. And I go on stage and I read, you know, like you know, Macbeth when he's holding the, the skull. And I take the can of Lysol and I start reciting all those real technical words and, you know, like, but I mean, really dramatic and overly dramatic. So I figure I'm going to make a mockery out of that. I'm going to make a joke. And she's going to kick me out of the class. I might as well, you know, get a kick out of it. Right. She says, <laughs> to my surprise, that is the most creative audition I've had in years. I said, I will definitely want to teach you. She says, this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm reading a can of Lysol. This is what I'm talking about. Creative. 
That was very creative. I, had, I picked it up on my way out. So I, I did a lot of plays for her. She really liked me. She, she really loved me. She, she was very supportive of me. She says, I've had a lot of people come through here and I can tell right away who has it and who doesn't. And you have it. <laughs> So it was, it was very encouraging. I mean, <clears throat> so that, I, so like I said, I already had done some acting. That's what I wanted to do. Right. And while I was doing a play, one of the guys in the play comes to me and shows me an article in the, not an article, but a notice in the Miami Herald say that they're opening a comedy club on the beach. And that's, I said, and I went. So you wrote, you wrote a book, uh, Revolution. Right. And, I mean, it's a great book and it's been out for a while. You put a lot of work into it. It's a congratulations on that, by the way. Thanks. But what I, now what I'm thinking is why haven't you written a book about all of this? Well, because Mike, listen, you know, I, I've seen a lot of comedians, friends of mine mm -hmm. uh, who write books about stuff like this, mm -hmm. you know, and it always, I always find it fascinating how these guys think that being nobody's, that nobody knows them. Anybody's going to be interested in their life. Let's yeah. face it, man. Right. You know, this is the type of book you write when you make it and then you go back and tell okay. the story of how, you got, how you made it and all the yeah. tribulations you went through to make it. Yeah. You know, nobody's interested in now Romero who they don't know who I am as to yeah. what I did. It sounds good because you know me and, you, and I got the opportunity to tell you the story and you laugh. But you know, nobody's going to pick up a book about Al Romero and his, uh, you know, fucked up life. You know, nobody's going to do that. You know, you know but now, revolution is a right. is a topic that right. people are going to be interested in because it's about the Cuban Revolution. A lot of people won't be interested in that. So that's why I wrote it that way. Yeah, like Rand, I know why you and Randy get along so well now because every time, <laughs> every time I would call Randy when I was, you know, after I got off the ships, I was trying to do stuff on land. Yeah, and I was like, okay, uh, I want to do a one man show. And he would say, Mike, who's going to come see Mike Pansy? <laughs> exactly. Well, he's right, Mike. But he is right. And he I, is. I just, and I that's didn't why like, you, you but know, he Mike. was right. He was right. And that's why he wrote a book about it. I have a many stories, which, you know, I mean, you know the story about me in the, in the, in the Navy. Right. You know, I don't know if we want to go, you know, I mean, that's for another show. Yeah. Uh, but, I, I mean, I have a lot of stories that are amazing, you know that, you know, go, wow, that's funny and that's interesting and stuff like that. But you know, nobody's, nobody wants to read that. About yeah, that. but I love the stories. They're fascinating. Not just because I know you, even if I, even if I didn't. I mean, when we were doing the shows, when we did those other shows before and you told the stories, I was like, this is great stuff. I mean, you know, these are well, movies because... that I've watched. These are actors that I know. This is a field that I'm in, you know. So I always think about you in terms of the young comedians starting out. Um, and then I remember when I was starting out, <clears throat> I used to talk to you. You were very supportive. You talk, I remember one thing you told me in the beginning was make sure you listen to everything everyone tells you and then don't do any of that. <laughs> exactly. Basically. Yeah. Well, but I have a philosophy, which I think is true, okay? You can't tell people. You can give advice in many other fields, but you can't give advice about how to be a comedian. You can, you, you're a comedy teacher. You can give techniques you can give ideas but you can't tell somebody how to be funny you mm -hmm. got to find it within yourself what mm -hmm. is funny and sometimes you don't even know what makes you funny you find out on stage what makes you funny right okay i'll give you an example uh if somebody would have seen uh rog i mean um williams uh kind of so bad at names robin williams uh, robin williams at the beginning, when he first started, it was, hey, listen, kid, you got to calm down. You have to bring the energy right. down. You're too right. over the top. Right. People can hear some of the stuff you're saying. You're going so fast that, you know, you're on to the next joke before you finish the first one. That would have been the worst advice anybody would give you. And that would be something that people watching him would have told him. Go to the other extreme. Stephen Wright, that would have told him, listen, man, you got to pick up your energy. Mm -hmm. You got to pick up your energy. You have to, you know, and you have to, you have to write jokes that, you know, people can relate to you. You're too cerebral. You're, you know, who knows? I heard, uh, I saw an interview with, um, uh, who's the guy he does the one liners, long hair, sunglasses, broke, died of a heroin overdose. Uh, oh. Mitch Hedberg. Oh, okay. 
and he was being interviewed and he was saying people were telling him, you know, uh, what to do. And he didn't agree with any of it and he wouldn't do any of it. And, and he was, you know, I, I agree. I tell my students to be themselves. I listen when I, what I do is I get them on stage. I try to get them to talk about themselves and be themselves. And then I listen as an audience. I try to listen as if I were an audience. And I think like they don't know what's funny when they're saying it. And sometimes I hear things that wait, wait. And I'll ask the class, did that part, did you guys like that part? And they're like, yeah, that part was great. That part was great. So it's a lot of auditioning. It's a lot of testing out material and also like being themselves. People, when they just talk to you, they're, they could be funny. And then they get on stage and they become this actor. They start doing their impersonation of a stand I know. Instead of being exactly. themselves. You know, yeah. my, the, what got me going was when I saw the movie uh, uh, about um, Lenny Bruce by, uh, and Dustin Hoffman was in it. And I was like, I want a job where I can say whatever I want, you know, because I was working as a counselor and I, I was saying whatever I wanted, but people were saying, Mike, you, you can't tell people they're criminals. You, you can't <laughs> tell the parents that their son is a criminal. And I'm like, well, why not? He is. <laughs> He, technically, he's committing crimes. He's a, my, you, you can't say that. So when I saw the movie Lenny Bruce and I saw he was getting arrested for saying whatever he wanted, I thought to myself, you know what? That's what I want to do. And then I started, I was in an improv troupe. I'd done some acting. I was in an improv troupe. And I got tired of other people telling me what they thought was funny. You know, the director of the play would say, you should do this. And I'm like, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. Like, that's not, whatever. so the thing about stand up was a similar thing I liked about wrestling was you are on your own it's you you're on your own you can't blame anybody else it's just you so um by the way do you hear my dog in the background yeah yeah, yeah. let me get rid of let me, let me let me open the so yeah so what was i saying i forgot we we're talking about uh do you know oh, being stand able up. to say whatever yeah yeah and i started winning contests oh a good example of someone telling you what not to do uh, I'll never forget when I first started out at the uh, Groucho's, Larry Silver, and he comes up to me after my set and he's like, listen, um, you know, you're supposed to get the audience to like you up front, you know? And uh, he says, uh, you know, you, you, you can't talk about stabbing people. Like that's not <laughs> to like you. And I was like, Larry, did you hear them laughing? Yeah. He goes, yeah, I know. I don't understand why they're laughing. I go, because... <laughs> And the way I came up with that, I was doing this show. Remember when me and Liz Farron and yes, Drew Satie and all these guys would do stuff? And there was a room called Up in Smoke above an Italian restaurant in Fort Lauderdale. And we were doing stand-up there. And all these mafioso guys were sitting in there after eating and they were smoking their cigars. And I'm standing there with my suit and tie and my hair slicked back in a ponytail with my Steven Seagal look. And I remember just staring at them, panicking, going, I better say something fast, uh, funny, fast right now. And I just go, all right, bring your picture back there, bro. Yeah, it's my wife calling me on the phone, man. Can you pause? Okay, so I remember, uh, so I'm standing there and I'm thinking, I got to say something funny. And I just go, so I'm stabbing this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone started laughing like they just pulling out of their chair and that used to be my opening line for the i longest. remember that i, re I remember i remember and that. I, I used to just say so i'm stabbing this guy and uh you know and and and, and, then, and i kept it in and then i added jews and polish and rednecks and one day i was doing a show on the ship and there was a lot of black people there so i just made fun of italians jews polish rednecks and there was a lot of black people in the audience and I go, I got to do it. I go, where are my black people? And they're like, yeah. And I go, welcome. <laughs> and they all started laughing. It was, yeah. it accomplished what I wanted to accomplish. Right. Without saying what I, it was hidden. I didn't have to say it. And then I was talking to Malcolm, the cruise director. And he's like, how come you, how come you never make fun of us? You know, he's a gay black cruise director. I go, what am I supposed to say? Uh, thanks for coming out. And he's like, yes, that's what you're supposed to say. So I've added that and I can't even, like people have heard that like simple line when I go, I'm wearing my gay people and like, thanks for coming out. It, I, it's so simple and obvious, but it gets a huge response. But, you know, figuring it out, like 
um, even in contests and things like, there were things that I considered to be very good writing and witty, but they weren't funny. Well, you know, we discussed this before. Yeah. Uh, I don't write for them. I write mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. But what stays in the act is what they tell me they find funny. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't I don't sit in my home and say, okay, I think they're going to think this is funny. No, I write what I think is funny. But mm -hmm. what stays in the act is what they tell me is funny. Oh, that's a good formula. Yeah. Unless, unless I really believe on the premise and I keep at it until I find the right combination to make it funny. You know, but that's, that's very seldom. Do you change, not your material, but do you change your persona, delivery, speed, or attitude based on the audience, like age, demographic, right? Yeah, a, a little bit. Not a lot. Not a lot. Mm -hmm. But I do, I, do, I do read the audience. You have to read your audience, you know. And, and there's some jokes that I don't do depending on the audience that I have. How do you, I know you've been doing it a long time and you, some of your material is the same, same thing for me. How do you personally keep it fresh and make it seem spontaneous and organic while you're on stage? Because that's uh, the acting part, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. You know, an, an actor on Broadway can do uh, a thousand shows, you know? Right. How do you make the 999th show as good as the first one? Right. Okay. You know, that's, that's the acting part of it, you know? Yeah. You know, and do you know. get nervous? On stage? Before stage. No, you see. I think I have a definition of being nervous. Nervous is on-channel adrenaline. Mm -hmm. Channel adrenaline is not nervous. So I do get the excitement and the adrenaline, but I've learned how to channel it mm -hmm. so I don't get nervous. What happens when you first start, you get all this adrenaline going and you don't know how to channel it. So it turns into nervousness, mm -hmm. you know, but if you know how to channel it, that adrenaline doesn't, is not nervous anymore. It's, uh, it's actually something positive because you can bring that on stage. You know? Right. Yeah, and then energy. when did you tell, or have you told your family that you're trying to be Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Remember we're talking about that. So anyway, so I finally tell, I tell a cousin of mine oh. about it and he looks at me like I have seven heads. Mm -hmm. He actually, I, I think I talked to him on the phone. He invited me out to lunch <laughs> and he tried to talk me out of it. He says, what are you doing? Are you out of your mind? Yeah. You, you have a great job. You make a lot of money. I was making a lot of money. I, I was selling computers at the time, you know, but not the personal computers, the ones that look like refrigerators and washing yeah. machines. Right. And you can make, I mean, I mean, the orders were like, like in the millions of dollars. So you can make a lot. I left over $100,000 worth of commission sitting on the table when I moved to LA to become a comedian. I mean, the, the order was not signed, but it was just a matter of waiting, you know. I mean, if, I, if it wasn't that Mitzi was so insistent that I move, I, I was going to stay another month or two, try to, you know, s close the deal and make the money. But uh, I said, fuck it, you know, I'm, I'm going. And this is it. And just turning the page and starting a new life. Uh, so, so, you know, he's trying to talk me out of it, you know, uh, but what sa my saving grace uh, that I do not have the pressure of my family uh, trying to talk me out of it is that I, I did a national TV show in, in one year of me starting doing comedy. I mean, uh, from the day I started doing comedy to the day I did uh, Murph Griffin, it was like a year. So after I did Murph Griffin, they couldn't call me crazy anymore. They right. couldn't tell me I was wasting my time anymore. Right. Then the next thing I know, I'm opening for Ray Charles. You know? So I mean, after that, they just they go, well, I mean, maybe this guy, maybe this guy's really mean business, you know. Maybe these guys know what he's doing, you know. Right. And then they started seeing me, you know, in, on TV shows and stuff like that. So now that, that stopped. But I tell you what, if I would have not been successful getting some kind of TV appearance early on. I think the pressure would have been a lot. Mm -hmm. I might have, I might have not stick around, you know. Are you still? In, do you still enjoy it? I enjoy the performing. I don't enjoy all the other shit that comes along with it, though. Right. I mean, on stage, I do, do, do but the traveling mm -hmm. and the putting up with the crap and, you know, and the bookings and you know and uh, that that just wear, wears you out, you know. Uh, how but do you, uh, how do you feel after you get off stage? Oh, I feel like a million. Well, if I have a great show, I feel like a I million feel bucks. High. 
I feel yeah, so yeah. high. I know, me too. But I mean, if I have a bad show, I want to kill myself. You know, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. no, of course you. You, you, you yeah. listen. It's, they say it that it's almost as good as sex. Yeah, you know, it is. I mean, you know, that's why people get addicted. It's like a drug, man. Yeah. I mean, once you once you're a performer and you become successful at it, or or. Right semi-successful at it right uh you you can't it's like uh it's like being addicted to a drug you can't you can't let it go you know well someone asked me today at work um at uh, the treatment center where i do groups she said so how are you doing with the you know uh with everything i know fine she says uh she goes are you have do you have any comedy shows and i go no and she goes do you feel a little down about that and i said yeah I, and I, I go i miss it i i miss Going on stage, I feel it's my drug. And, you know, like, even though I have other things I'm doing, I'm making money and I love doing it, I miss that knowing Friday night I have a show that I'm going to go to and walk in front of a group of people and try to make them laugh. When you're well, a performer, you have to perform. Yeah. You know, if, if, you, if, if, if you see yourself as a performer and this is what you do, this is your life, then, you know, you have to perform. You have to perform. Yeah, it's, I remember uh, one time. I remember one time, my wife and I, you know, were having a little problems, so we went to a marriage counselor, and uh, she said, "I don't remember what she said about no, uh, no, because see, the problem is that he wants to be a, you know, he's trying you know, to be. He's trying to, you know, or wants to be a comedian. I go, ah, you know, I no, because I don't remember what the boy says." I am a comedian. I remember, Al, you yeah. told me this in your car. We were going to a gig on the West Coast at some restaurant. And you were telling me this story, pounding on the steering wheel. I am not trying to be a comedian. <laughs> I, I am, am a fucking a comedian. comedian. <laughs> and uh, I was, yeah. I swear, I'm not exaggerating. <clears throat> my, my stomach hurt from laughing in the car. Yeah. It was great. But that encapsulates what we're trying to talk about. I mean, this is, once you see yourself that way, you got to yeah. do it, you know? Yeah. You have to. You know, my biggest concern with this uh, virus thing that's going on is forgetting my act. And I've heard, a, I've seen a lot, of com a lot of guys on Facebook saying the same thing, that they're yeah. scared that they might forget their act. You know, right. the longest I've gone without doing my act is three months when I did a movie in Morocco. Well, a lot of people are really happy about that, Al. A lot of people. <laughs> And me Double. too. Yeah. And me too. I posted yeah. something recently that said I'm either gonna have, either I'm gonna have to write new material or other people. Hopefully, they will forget my act. Well, thank God I have it. I have it on. I have my act on a yeah. CD, so I can listen to it. I know? just thought about that today. Like, I wonder what it's gonna be like to go up. Are you gonna lose a little bit of your timing? Um, the timing. I don't, I'm not worried about that. Yeah. I'm not worried about the timing. I don't worry yeah. about the form forming. Uh, I'm worrying about the material. I'm worrying about forgetting about, uh, you know, uh, the delivery. Of, I guess that's part of timing, you know. And, I, you know, I mean, have you ever blank on stage? Yeah. That's the worst feeling in the world, man, when you, when you don't know what the next word is going to come out of your mouth. You know, you know, it happened to me worse with a, a lecture I was doing at a, a, it was a DUI program in Cincinnati, Ohio. And my brother was there. My little brother came to see me. I was in my 20s. And it was a big presentation on alcoholism. And I could talk about alcoholism and counseling, addiction and group and therapy for probably 10 hours straight or two days. I could talk about it, right? I was up there. I spoke for about five or 10 minutes and felt like <laughs> I said everything I needed to say. And I could not think of anything else to say. So I kept going, are there any questions? <laughs> Are there any questions? And I could not think of one more thing to say. So I literally yeah. said, listen, you know what? We're going to take a break. I'm going to come back in five minutes. And I had to. I couldn't. I was fine after that. I know. I know. But no, well, it's ha uh, it happens on stage. That's what crowd work is. That's what crowd work comes in handy. I was, I was just going to say that. Yeah. yeah. You know, so where are you from? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have no clue what's going to come out of my mouth, but where are you from? And, and you know, I used to think crowd work was laziness for a comedian who didn't have a lot of time. And in some cases it is. But then what happened was, if you're good at it, anyway, what happened was on the ships on Carnival, when they went from the, you had to do the five 30 minute shows. Right. You had to do the, uh, the one, uh, what was it? Two R, one clean, 
what was how does it work two clean two well, are two clean three three uh, adults right so i would do one and they'd say oh and you can repeat some of your material and i'm like no because if they like you they're coming back i know to see you so i had to split it all up and then the fifth show though i didn't have like another 30 minutes so i did a lot of either old material i never did new material i was working on or a lot of crowd work right and i realized because they like you already they've seen you four times they've seen you clean they've seen you dirty whatever they're coming back the last night they love crowd work oh they do i mean the audience like they because you're making them part of the show right you know, you bringing them into your show instead right. of just just instead of just talking to them, right. you're making them part of the show. They people love that. Well, then that's the comedy. That's a comedy club type of thing. But then you have a club like the Improv, where they don't want that. Oh, they don't. No, they the Improv. I've noticed is they they actually make people turn their phones off. I know that's not related, but they make them. They don't want. They don't really like the audience talking to the comedian and they really don't, I don't think they want the comedian talking to the audience that much. It's more like a TV show. It's more like, uh, I just get the feeling they, they discourage crowd work. Well, it's a shame because I, you know, I love it. I love doing yeah. crowd work. I, I, I really, I really enjoy going to the audience and talking to them and, uh, and, you know, interacting with them and, yeah. and thinking of the top of my head, you know, and you're really good at it. And that's why if I'm not the headliner, like if I'm the feature, I don't do crowd work because I feel like I should leave that for the headliner. No, no, exactly. I, the same thing. I mean, uh, I mean, I, I haven't done, you know, middle act in a long time, but, uh, but sometimes like when Randy wants you to open for like supposedly a big name coming in, that is a comedian. I do the same thing. I just do material. I don't do right. crowd work. Or anything, right. You know? Cause that, that's his or her show. Right. You know, I respect that. And I, I like to I'll let them have the leverage and the opportunity to do whatever they want. And if exactly. you do that, you kind of take it away from them. If you do that. Exactly. 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 You know, and I, don't, I would not like them to do it for me. Right. So I don't do it to them. You know. Well, one thing I'm glad that we didn't talk about for a little while was the virus, actually. Really? Yeah. I'm glad we didn't because I am so sick and tired of hearing <laughs> about it and talking about it. I know. And, man. and I'm this glad is... that we're doing this. And I think we should keep doing it. Um, I thank everybody for listening and we're going to do this every Saturday, every, every Saturday night. I think we should keep doing it. We've been talking about doing it for a long time and I'm glad I we're, know. Finally, we're finally doing it. Um, it only took a worldwide pandemic <laughs> for us to do this. <laughs> so guys, when did you, why did you start doing it? It was a pandemic. Exactly. The world needed us. Exactly. Al Romero and Michael Penziga said, we will be there for you on Saturday night at 8.30. No, so the next, the next time we meet, I'll, I'll tell the story about the, in the Navy when... Uh, you were the chef, they, the cook. Yeah when, they, yeah, when they told me that I had to cook for the whole entire ship. I'll tell right. that story the next time. You know? All right, good. So I want to thank everybody for listening. And uh, follow us on Facebook. Leave your comments. And... Uh, We'll see you next week. Thanks a lot. And, it, and if Michelle, if Michelle Fiverr is listening to this <laughs> in a platonic way, because I'm married now, right, I right, still right. would like to take. Yeah. I would still like to take you to a Q and right. And Oliver Stone, go fuck yourself. <laughs> go fuck yourself, you bastard. <laughs>